Union Crossing Church, how we doing? Hey, my name's Nick, I'm the Dean of Students at the Crossing College, and I am super excited to be here tonight for week two of the best news I never heard. Look at the person next to you and tell them, I never heard that. I also never saw that guy get on the stage and preach, you can tell him that too. Hey, I just want to say really quick, before I get into the talk today, I want to say thank you to, to Pastor Eric and Kelly for giving me the opportunity to stand up here. What I want to remind everyone is, is in life, we're all given a platform. And sometimes we forget about who built the platform that we're standing on. And right now, I just want to recognize in front of everyone here that, that God has given us a platform, this church. He's given us lots of opportunities. He's given us spiritual life here. And he's done that through our leaders. Can we just give it up for them really quick? A church, check this out, a church stays healthy when they continue to be grateful for their leaders, to celebrate their leaders, and when they continue to pray for their leaders. And I just want to remind you of that today. If you're not doing that, please, like Pastor Eric and Kelly, they need this group to be on their team. They need the encouragement, they need the, the gratefulness, and then the prayer as well. Does that sound good? Yeah. Hey, today we're talking about the beast of the gospel. Everybody say, the beast. The beast. Hey. One of my favorite things to do as a teacher is to title a talk in such a way that nobody knows what the heck you're talking about, <laughs> right? So we should probably define a couple terms before we get started. Number one, by gospel, I just mean good news. Ever heard somebody say, hey, let's go preach the gospel. I don't know about you, but when I grew up, I thought that meant you got to go around to tell people, you suck and you got to believe stuff like me. I thought that that's what the gospel meant. That's not the gospel. The gospel means good news. When we say go preach the gospel, we're saying go preach good news. By beast, I mean bad news. Everybody say bad news. Bad news. And it, this is really the concept that I want to talk about today is, is does the gospel have some good news and some bad news? Because I think this is pretty much rampant in our culture. We actually have a catchphrase about it, right? We say, oh, you've got to read the fine print. We're always looking for bad news to follow good news. Let me tell you how I went when I grew up. I went to a church. It was, a, it was a conservative, churchy church, all right? And they would say, hey, you get free donuts and coffee if you come to church. And me and my brother were like, yeah, high five, I'm in for that. And then we ate the donut and coffee, and then it was like you would sit through this hour-long, insanely boring sermon, and this is what we do. You sit on your pew, and you'd bang your head against the pew in front of you until your forehead was numb and you'd pass out. <laughs> we may or may not have done that. By the way, that's why we do kids ministry here is we don't want your kids to have to bang their head against the seat in front of you, all right? Uh, I was researching lottery winners recently. How many of you in here would say, hey, I would love to win the lottery. That would be some good news right there, yeah. Really, like, that's like half of you. Anybody else want to win the lottery? I don't know. I would like to win the lottery. Here's, this, here's the deal about the lottery, though. If you win $100 million, the bad news is, depending on what state you live on, roughly 50% of that would go to the government. Now, how many of you are thinking, well, I'm not good at math, but that's still $50 million. My hand is still up, right? That's still good news. But what if I told you seven out of 10 people who win the lottery will be broke after a matter of three or, three or four years? 70%. Would you still, if I told you, hey, you're going to win the lottery, but most likely you'll be worse off afterwards than if you had never won. Your hand is like, yeah, I don't know. Like, what do we do with that? That's some serious bad news mixed in with the good news. And sometimes I feel like we think that way about ourselves too, right? We're like, hey, I got, I got some good news about myself, but I also have some bad news, right? I'm the, I'm the director of the Crossing College, or I'm the dean of students at the Crossing College, whatever my title is, I don't even know. I work at the church staff, but guess what? I have bad days, I'm a normal person. There's some days I wake up and I'm anxious. Some days I wake up and I have some thoughts and feelings that I wish I didn't have. And we feel that way about ourselves sometimes, right? It's the Friday, it's the Friday night Facebook feed. It's all the cool people that you hung out with, all the cool places that you went to, but then on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, Wednesday there's just like no posts, right? And <laughs> It's just like a bunch of complaints about the media and politics and stuff. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's some good news and some bad news. What I want to do today is I want to I talk about this concept of good news and bad news and how we mix it together. And then I want to look at what the Bible actually says about this good news, bad news concept. Are you ready to get to work? Yeah. All right, so theologians in the Bible 
or not in the Bible, theologians that study the Bible call this the sin nature. It's your independent rebellious self. It's that little part of you that's like, I'll do what I want. You want me to go to church? I do what I want. No thanks. Little Nick, they called me when I was young, they called me Action Adventure Nick because I was always doing something, I was always getting into something, I was always saying something, making noise, whatever. My grandma had this antique bell collection and uh, I remember, <laughs> oh, this is bad. I was like four, okay, give me a break. I was like four and, uh, and I remember looking at those bells like, what do, you, what do you have a bell collection for? Bells are made for one reason, and that's to ring it. And that's what I was about to do. I went into every single one of those bells, ring-a-ling-a-ling, got to touch them all, got to ring them all, got to catch them all, right? <laughs> Pokemon style. That's what I had to do. And I remember my mom came up to me and she was like, no, don't touch those bells. All the relatives were watching like, how, how is she going to take care of this little problem? <laughs> what do you think I did as soon as she did that? Oh my gosh, it was game on. For those of you who don't know me, I'm competitive. If you want to start a competition, let's go. Game on, mom. Look, woman. I'm in charge here, I'm about to beat you, I'm about to win. My little four-year-old rebellious self was coming out. And that's exactly what I did. I took both hands, all the bells, let's go mom, bring it on. She slapped me so many times that eventually my hand got so red she felt bad. <laughs> and it wasn't working at all, and so she stopped. And I was like, yeah, winner. I like me now, mom. Hey, as we're talking about the sin nature thing, I'm a visual person, I like, I like I like illustrations that help me understand stuff. And so I've asked, I've asked Pastor Silas if he, could, if he could spare an extra sin nature for us. You got an extra sin nature for us? That's so nice. Yeah! Everybody say, hi, beast. Hi, beast. This is the beast. He's going to represent the sin nature over here. This is the independent, rebellious self. This is little action-adventure Nick over here, all right? And the beast comes out once in a while. Okay, so let's take a look at what the Bible says. This is, this is Romans 7.15. Apostle Paul speaking, one of the most prolific spiritual leaders in his day in the early church, he said, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Anybody ever felt like that before? You're like, I want to stop drinking, but I keep drinking. I want to get better grades in school, but eh, I'd rather play video games. I want to stop treating my spouse that way, but I just can't seem to stop. Oh gosh, it just got quiet in here. <laughs> right? We all have this struggle that goes on. We, we do these things that we don't want to do. We're like our heart's in the right place, but why do we keep going back? It's because there's this little, this little beast thing going on inside of us. It's that rebellious self that gets stirred up once in a while. Check out King David. This is Old Testament, Old Testament style, Psalm 51.5. King David is one of the most popular uh, men of God in the Old Testament. Uh, one of the most amazing kings to ever live in, in ancient Israel, and he said this about himself. Surely, I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. What is going through your mind, what is going through your life that you would say something about yourself like that? Can you imagine, like, surely I was a sinner from the moment I came out of the womb. How many of you were here for Pastor Kelly's talk last night, or last week? Was that good? Yeah, yeah I think King David was like, he just needed to stay in the formation process a little bit. I think he came out a little bit too early. If you know anything about King David, you find out that he actually killed someone so that he could get with that person's wife. That's King David. And God chooses him to speak on behalf of the people. It's my understanding that sometimes God takes people in really dark places and he says, hey, I'm gonna raise that person up as an example to show you, to teach you that it doesn't matter what you've done, who you've done, or where you've been, God can still use you. In fact, I think he just enjoys people who have this beast thing going on a little bit, a little bit extra style. There's two prophecies in the Old Testament. Uh, ancient Bible prophets have been saying this for a long time. Two prophecies concerning this beast that's going on, this rebellious self that we got going on. Number one, <clears throat> I mix this up. Number one, the Messiah would come to fix everything and God would give us a supernatural ability to follow him. You can jump right into that next verse. First John, or John 4, this is basically a Messiah prophecy. I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Now in our culture, 
We have the Messiah thing going on all over the place. It's all over our media, right? Mowgli saves the jungle. Batman saves Gotham. Harry Potter saves Hogwarts. Like the Messiah thing is all over our culture. Everybody's heard that concept. Whether or not you're a Bible person or a spiritual person, everybody has this concept of Savior coming down, make everything right again. But here's the second prophecy, and this is funny because Pastor Kelly used this in her offering talk. We did not coordinate this. People miss, over, miss this. This is the second biggest prophecy in the Old Testament. Thing, things that people were looking forward to, they were expecting, they were anticipating. Ezekiel 36. <clears throat> I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender and responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey all my regulations. See, apparently, apparently God recognized that there was a problem we had. And he was saying, hey, someday, someday I will fix that problem. Now, I don't know about you, but this started when I was about nine or 10 years old. I started to ask myself, is it possible to get free from what I'm dealing with? I asked myself that as a third grader. I was going through some struggles at the time. I was on medication by the time I was 10 years old. And I remember asking, I wonder if it's possible to get free. And then I came across this verse, John 8, 32. This is Jesus. He said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I was like, yes, it is possible. What's the truth? I, can you give me that little secret sauce? Can you, put, can you add some of that on? Because I just want to get free. But this verse seems to imply something. When you believe lies, you stay in bondage. When you know the truth, you get free. They invited me to come talk today about three big lies that people learn in church. Are you guys ready? Yeah. yeah, they're like, who's this college guy? Teaches at the college, he's gonna talk about lies today. Are you ready? We're gonna talk about lies. But I should probably, I should probably pray before we talk about lies, all right? Jesus, I just thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I thank you for what you've uh, been showing me and revealing me this last summer and over the last several months. I just ask that you would use my words to encourage everyone in this room. Uh, I pray, Holy Spirit, that there would be an awakening and awareness of what you have already done for us and your presence. I just ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 All right, so three big lies I learned in church about the beast. I grew up in church, and this little dilemma here People gave me lots of different answers about how to deal with that stuff that you wanted to get free from. How do you deal with the beast inside of you? This is the first kind of church that I went to. It was called the No Gospel Church. Everybody said, no gospel. gospel. They said, clean the beast. Don't worry about the beast, basically. Just be a good person. Now, let me just tell you you what this looks like. This is how we do it in churches sometimes. We use this brush. This is the dew brush, right? The dew brush, there's a pun there. Just wait, wait for it. All right, this is the dew brush. This is what we do. We go, hey, go to church, say good things, be a nice person, say please and thank you, go to Bible studies, do some good stuff, clean yourself up on the outside so that nobody can see what's going on on the inside. Take a look at what the Bible says. Isaiah 64, 6. All of us have become like one who is unclean, All of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Basically, it's saying, hey, check this out. You're trying to clean yourself with a dirty toilet brush. I wanted to bring a dirty one up here like I really wanted to, and then I realized maybe I just crossed the line on the illustration, so I think you you guys get the idea. All right, so that doesn't work. But then we do this. We go, oh, okay, so it's not about doing good things. It's about avoiding. It's about avoiding what's going on on the inside, right? Don't smoke. Don't chew. Don't swear. Don't hang out with those bad people. Don't listen to that bad music. Don't watch those bad movies. Don't, 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 right? (laughs) This is kind of (laughs) weird. We want to scrub ourselves up on the outside. We want to look clean on the outside. We do this at church all the time. We show up nice. We We got our smile on. We got our best clothes on. We're trying to look good in front of other people. We're dealing with exterior stuff, and God's like, I don't care about the exterior. I'm looking at what's going on on the inside. I want to deal with what's going on on the inside. Colossians 2.23, these rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help 
in conquering a person's evil desire. Apparently this brush isn't gonna do you any good. Let me tell you something about do's and don'ts in church. Do's and don'ts don't do nothing about the beast. It doesn't do anything about what's going on on the inside. You can do as much as you want. You can avoid as much sin as you want. It doesn't take care of what's going on on the inside. That's the no gospel church. There's no good news there. Just clean yourself up. Number two is a half gospel. It says, Jesus forgave you. Now all you gotta do is just fight the beast. I spent many years in this type of a church. This is one of the biggest lies that I learned in church. But I wanna say something because there actually is some good news here. There actually is some good news. No matter how many times this comes out of you, no matter how many times you do the bad thing, you do the wrong thing, no matter how many times those thoughts come in your mind, those feelings come in your mind, no matter how many times the beast comes out of you, Jesus says, I'll forgive you. Doesn't matter how many mistakes you made. We talked about two guys in the Bible. Apostle Paul was a murderer before he came to know Jesus. King David was also a murderer and an adulterer. And God said, I'll forgive you. I can still use you. But then we say, okay, so that's good. We'll forgive you. Now you just gotta fight it. And then we get back into this whole, this whole do's and don'ts thing. Now, when I was in the youth group, let me tell you how this went down. We had WWJD bracelets. Anybody have those growing up? Yeah, all the churchy church people are like, yeah, me. I still got mine on. Anybody still got theirs on? I'm about to step on some toes if you still got one on. All right. It stood for, what would Jesus do? Oh, man, I remember when I first got my bracelet, I thought I was hot stuff, man, in youth group. This was awesome. This was my Jesus mantra. I was like, this is how I'm going to live my life. There's only one problem with the what would Jesus do bracelet. You can never live up to what Jesus did. <laughs> Every time I tried to do it, I was like, no, I suck. I can't do it. And then it would become like the self-righteous thing, too. You know, we'd be like, you want to go to that movie tonight? Would Jesus go to that movie? <laughs> hey, you want to go hang out at this party tonight? Would Jesus go to that party? <laughs> and suddenly our Christian mantra that we were all shouting at youth group became this ball and chain that had, had us hung up, literally serving the sinful self, this independent, rebellious self. The more I tried to do it on my own, the more I realized I was stuck. The Apostle Paul actually addresses a church like this in the Bible. The book of Galatians is, is probably my favorite book in the New Testament, but basically he wrote a message for a half gospel church. This is what he said to them, Galatians 1, 6, and 7. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news, but it is not good news at all. <laughs> I love that. Paul, Paul was like, he was just like Jesus. He was the rock of offense. He was like, I'm not afraid to offend people with the gospel. And he would totally call people out and he was like, that's not good news right there. <laughs> Jesus forgives you, but you're still just living in a bunch of self-effort, self-righteousness. Hey, remember this is the independent rebellious self. It's all about self. Self-indulgence, self-righteousness, self-reliance, self-dependence, self, 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 self. And many of us in church, we believe Jesus forgave us and then we depend on ourselves to live a good Christian life. Paul says, that ain't the gospel. You're not believing good news. That's bad news. That's trash. Throw that out. You're mixing some bad news and some good news. And this is the trippy, part, the trippy part about the half gospel. The more you fight it, the bigger it will get. You just made Hulk angry. He's about to do a Hulk smash. You made the sin nature angry by trying to fight it. Check out Romans 7, 5. When we were controlled by our old nature... Sinful desires were at work within us. And the law, or rules, do's and don'ts, aroused those evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds resulting in death. In other words, this. The more you try to fight that, you're cultivating it. <laughs> the more you think about this and, and try to fight what's going on on the inside, it's just going to get bigger. One of my favorite authors, this is John Crowder. He wrote this in a book. This is a good one. He said, the law is powerless to protect you from temptation. It will only incite more sin. This is because the law can only give you a no. Do not eat this. Do not touch this. Now, are, is the law bad? No. Rules are good. If we didn't have rules, we would have no order, 
right? We need to know which side of the road to drive on. We need to know where we need to stop and where we need to go. Laws and rules are good, but they don't do anything to what's going on in the inside of you. So here's a little, little application before we move on. What area of your life have you been trying to clean up by yourself? I left a little room, a very, very little room on your note sheet, but <laughs> write that down. What area of your life have you been trying to clean up by yourself? You can stop trying to clean that, by the way. You should throw that in there. Don't try to clean it. Let's move on. Number three, third biggest lie. Everybody say, number three. Everybody say, lies. Lies. We're getting to the truth. Don't worry. We'll talk about truth in a little bit. But I like talking about lies first. Three-quarter gospel. You aren't just forgiven. He gives you a new spirit. You don't have to fight that beast anymore. This is, this is legit. By the way, this is the moment in church. This is the moment where something inside of you like awakens. Something inside that was dead is like, oh my gosh, I'm alive. I don't know how to explain that, but my desires changed. I used to go to the bar and enjoy that, and now I just don't enjoy it anymore. Or I used to go on the party scene, but now when I gave my life over, it was like, I just don't enjoy it. Like something inside of me is changing. My desires are changing. Something inside is happening that is good. Pastor Silas, do you have something good for me on the front row to represent represent the good self. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is good you. Oh, everybody say, oh. Yeah. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy, by the way, in Ezekiel. God says, when you give your life to Jesus, I will put my spirit inside of you. Check out Acts 2. Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins. Repent means just have a change of mind and turn to God. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you and your children and even to the Gentiles. Anybody who wants this, if you want to be reconciled to God, if you don't have a relationship with God, God says, all you got to do is ask and I will give it to you. I will put my righteousness inside of you. Now, before we jump into the very next verse, I need to give you a little intro. Because... Paul writes this letter to this church in Corinth and they had this issue going on. They had some beast going on in their church. In fact, there was a dude that they found sleeping with his stepmother. How many of you are like, yeah, it's a little bit too much beast, like put the beast away there, all right? Not cool. Don't do that in church. Don't think about what I just said too much, all right? Wow. Oh my gosh. Let's keep moving. This is what Paul says. This is what Paul says to that church. With that going on in the church, he says this in 1 Corinthians. Don't you realize that this sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? He's talking about that dude in the church. Get rid of that old yeast, get, get, get rid of that person by removing the wicked person from among you. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Now hold on just for a second. Let me, let me read that last line again. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Are you, are you picking this up really quick? He's saying, this is actually who you are, my friends. When you give your life to Jesus and Holy Spirit moves in, this is actually the new you. Listen, this is what a lot of Christians think. They think, hey, God gave me a new heart and he put it right on top of my old dirty self. And now I will be the most bipolar Christian on the face of the planet, <laughs> battling my natures within me. Little devil, little angel on one side, it's just gonna be spiritual warfare inside of me. How many would say, that's gonna suck? That's gonna suck. God didn't do that, that's not what the prophecy said. He said, I will replace it. I will replace this old self with the new self. I will replace the dirty self with the righteous self. I will replace this old rebellious self with the self with a tender and responsive heart. This is the best news that I never heard. It's called the full gospel. Jesus killed that beast. It is dead. It's dead. What does dead mean? Dead means dead. I mean, it ain't alive. I know what some of you are thinking. You're like, oh, no, 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 no. My rebellious self comes out once in a while. It's like alive, man. It's twitching. It's like a dead corpse on the floor. And it's like, woo, I'm alive. It's not alive, it's dead. When you receive the Holy Spirit, it died. 
Now, I'm not saying that you're never gonna be tempted and that sin isn't gonna be tempting and that we're never gonna struggle again. But what I'm saying is, that is not you anymore. Do not make agreements with your old self. Do not make agreements with your old rebellious self. That is not who you are in Christ. Man, I learned, I learned so much heresy in Sunday school. I love this. Check this out. This is what I learned. God's over here. God's over here. And he's like, I'm all righteous and stuff. I'm holy God. I'm clean. I'm awesome. And I know you over there, you dirty sinner. You're a bad person. And then Jesus, Jesus steps in the gap, right? Jesus comes and he dies. And then he, he gives God. God sees you now through the lens of Jesus, Right? He knows you're a dirty sinner over there, but he sees you through the lens of Jesus. That's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. Listen up. God doesn't need a lens to look at you. He doesn't need some special goggles to look at you. He looks at you and he says, holy, righteous, approved, right? Deeply loved, highly favored, greatly blessed, totally righteous, destined to reign. There's no asterisks after the fifth banner over there. It's like, ooh, just don't forget you're still a dirty sinner. No. <laughs> don't forget your old self is dead. Right. Yeah. It's not alive. It's not alive anymore. This is you. There's a verse. This isn't on your note sheet. There's a verse in Romans 8. It says this. It said, God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh to condemn sin in the flesh. Let me just break this down for you really quick. He said, I sent Jesus in the flesh, just like you and me, in the likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus came, he was burping, he was farting, he was a dude. Jesus was a dude, okay? But there's one difference between Jesus. He didn't have this attachment to sin going on. He didn't have this attachment to struggle going on. Catch this for a second. Jesus did not just die to pay the penalty for what you done. He died to render this powerless to cut you loose from your old life, to cut you loose from your old thoughts, to set you free. 1 Corinthians, 1, 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, Jesus became your justification and your sanctification. He made you right with God, and then he cleaned you up on the inside. You were clothed with Christ. It's not a process of cleaning ourselves up. It's a one-and-done deal that Jesus did on the cross. Is that good news? Yeah. This is who you are. I know some of, you, some of you Bible people are like, I don't know if I believe that. Pretty sure I still have a dirty self. I'm gonna be honest, I did think that. I, up until about six months ago, I thought that. I was believing a three-quarter gospel. I was believing that I had God's spirit, but I was still kind of dirty and still had this deal going on. And it was like God opened up my heart and he's like, no, that's not who you are. My presence is inside of you. And this changes everything. Because we show up to church and we're like, oh God, send your presence down. Open up the heavens for us. And God's like, I already did. My presence is inside of you. You are the presence of God on earth. The point of, uh, oh gosh, I'm so excited that we're gonna get into this series in a couple weeks. We got our fall launch coming up and we're gonna talk about how to hear God, how to listen to Holy Spirit inside of you. Spiritual disciplines, by the way, they're all meant to just cause an awareness of God's presence with you. God's presence is with you all the time. He literally united your soul together with him, like a marriage ceremony. All right, back to you Bible people that are like, I'm not, I don't know if it's dead. I don't know if that's really what the Bible teaches. Okay, let's, let's talk about the Bible. Colossians 2.11, when you came to Christ, you were circumcised, uh, but not by a physical procedure. Everybody say, amen. 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 Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. Right. Romans 6, 6. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ. What's crucified mean? It's dead. It's not alive. Crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. If you need another one, look up Galatians 5:24. It says, our old sinful selves, our old flesh, our sin nature was crucified with Christ with all its passions and desires. It's done. Jesus put it to death. So what do we do with this? What are we supposed to do with this information? Nice analogy, Nick. I love the teddy bear. Can I take the teddy bear home? No, I gotta use this for a couple more services, all right? 
I know there's somebody in here who's gonna ask, can I have that Hulk doll? No, wait till the weekend's over. What do I do with this? The answer is to embrace, embrace the good news. This is kind of a catch. People don't like hearing this. This offends people in church. What do I do? You don't do anything. You believe. People don't like to hear this. People leave churches for this message. People get offended by this message. Pharisees killed Jesus for this message. Because they said, no, 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 you gotta do all the stuff. Jesus said, no, you need to be born again. You need God to do for you what you can't do for yourself. Only he can clean you up on the inside. Galatians 3.2, let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. This is the gospel, you guys. We are saved by grace through faith. You didn't do anything to get it. The moment God awakens your heart and gives you that spiritual awakening, and it's just like, I don't know what happened, like I'm just different. That's the moment of salvation. Nothing you did, nothing you did to try to clean yourself up. The moment you believed, he moved into you. What does it look like to embrace the gospel? I've been thinking about this for a while. Like when, when, when God gave me this little awakening and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm new. I'm not old anymore. I'm new. I was like, what does that look like? I don't understand. How does that work itself out? It looks like two, two things. Number one, stop trying to clean yourself up. You've been trying to clean yourself up, you can stop. That's God's job. The way you overcome sin and struggle is not by fighting it, it's resting in what he already did and what he will continue to do in you. That's how you overcome struggle. Hebrews 4, for whoever enters God's rest also rests from his own work just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. I love that. God's like, if you're going to make an effort, make an effort to rest. If you're going to do something, if you're going to pull out the scrub brush, make it be about resting. I used to think that living in faith was believing a bunch of doctrinal statements. Yeah, I believe all the stuff on the church website. Uh, I signed the Crossing College Student Handbook, the, uh, you know, all the belief statements. That's not faith. That's a belief statement. Faith is is rest. It's rest in what God did for you and what he will continue to do in you. The opposite of faith is works. We're called to live in rest. Are you living in rest? Our fall launch is coming up and one of the things that we encourage people to do is to share the good news. But let me tell you right now, don't you dare go share the good news out of religious obligation with your scrub brush. We share what God has done in us because it's overflowing. We can't help but share the good things that God has done for us. It's not about cleaning yourself up and doing what the pastor, the pastor said, I have to, I have to, I'm going to feel guilty if I don't. No, no, no. Let the Holy Spirit work inside of you. I love what Pastor Kelly said. If your want to is busted, ask God to give you the want to again. Number two, embrace your identity in Christ. Embrace your new self. I just had a conversation with a friend of mine last week and uh, he was just saying, man, I, I became a believer in the last year and it was like everything changed, like all my desires and wants changed. But he said, I was still going through the same behaviors. He was like, I was still doing all the same things. He's like, I would still go to the bars with my friends. I just didn't like it anymore. And he was like, I would still engage in some of the stuff I used to do. I just didn't enjoy it anymore. And I said, you need to embrace your new identity. It's not that you're cleaning yourself up. You can just leave those old behaviors behind. God changed you. Put on your new self. I love Ephesians 4.24. This is, this is good stuff. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self. Check this out. Created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. That's your new self. I thought that renewing my mind was cleaning up my thoughts and my feelings in here. I thought it was about reorganizing how I thought. I thought if I just changed my thinking, then God would be happy. That's not renewing your mind. Renewing your mind is coming to understand what God has done for you. It's coming to live in your new identity. 
is coming to see yourself with the presence of God living inside of you every single step of every single day. That's renewing your mind. Whoa. An awareness of God's presence. I wanna leave you, I wanna leave you with this. This is uh, probably the biggest takeaway that I had from this, preparing this message. It's not about what you do to get yourself free. It's about what God did to free you. It's never about us. Faith is about what God did. It's already done. Now, I, I know I've gone kind of long, so I gotta wrap it up. But there's two people in the room right now. There's people in here that are like, I don't know if this transition has taken place. People think this. I know there's people in the room right now that are thinking this. I don't know if that transition has actually taken place. And then there's a second group. You say, I know the transition has taken place. I just, I am constantly not in a state of rest. We're gonna do something a little bit weird in here because I'm preaching. It already got weird, okay? In Acts 8, in Acts 8, there's a story of a bunch of believers who believed in Jesus, got baptized, and it said they didn't get the Spirit. I don't know how that happened. They went, believed in Jesus, they got baptized for some reason, like nobody told them about it. I don't know what happened. They never got awakened to a new life change inside. And it says that they got the apostles and they were like, let's go lay hands on, hands on these people and pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit. What I want to do tonight, if you're in either of those two boats, you've been a, a believer who hasn't been resting, you're just like, I just need to get filled up with the Spirit again. I needed a new awakening of what God has already done inside of me. Or if you're sitting here and you're going, I'm not sure if the transition even took place. If you're in either of those boats, I want you to come up front. We're gonna pray over you. You can come up front right now. I'm gonna give you plenty of time. I don't believe that God gave me this message for no reason. I believe there's people in this room that need to be filled with the Spirit. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, come on up front. We're gonna lay hands. You can clap when people come up. I'm gonna give you plenty of time. Don't worry, about, don't worry about who's sitting next to you. Don't worry about what people are thinking. I don't care if you've already believed in Jesus. I don't care if you just believed for the first time. If you need to get filled with God's spirit, don't leave here without doing it. Okay, yeah, come on front. We do, the more the merrier. Come on up, come on up. Check this out. The Bible actually commands us to be continually filled with the spirit. It's actually not a, one and, it's not a one and done like, oh, I get filled up once and now I'm good for the rest of my life. No, 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 no. God's like, you need to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. You need to continually be renewed with the want to's and the new desire. Being filled with the Spirit is a big deal. There's a reason why the apostles would ask believers on a regular basis, did you get the Spirit? That's a big enough deal. We don't want people going to church, going through the motions and not getting any life change. If I could just have this, the staff is already up here. We're just gonna, I just want you to lay hands on somebody next to you. Lay hands on somebody next to you. Staff, if we, can, if we can get some of the section leaders, just laying hands on each other. We're just gonna pray together. You don't have to repeat after me, I'll just pray. Jesus, I ask right now, I thank you for the boldness that it took and the courage that it took for these people to step up here. You already paid the price for them. You already gave them access to the new spirit. So I ask, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would awaken their souls. Give them a renewed vision. Fill them with your spirit. Fill them up with power. Fill them up with boldness. Fill them up with courage. I ask that you would place a special anointing on every person that came up front, that their life would never be the same from the moment they prayed this prayer. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen.